<coughs> well, I'd like to talk about the research I've been doing up in the bonnie bonnie banks of Loch Lomond. It's always sunny up there as well, as you all know. Um, just a very summary, we, we did a rapid walkover survey of uh, targeted areas uh, in Arica and we re revealed 88 new sites belonging to a busy rural community. And over two seasons, we excavated a uh, couple of 17th century structures and uh, a 17th century store or lookout on the shores of Loch Lomond. So the origin of this project uh, actually lies back in 2011, when I first joined Fiona Jackson and Sue Furness on the Highmore Lagan project near the, near the village of Araka. Uh, I then helped Sue and Fiona to develop another project called the Hidden Heritage Project, uh, which um, surveyed the isthmus between Loch Lomond and Loch Long. And uh, despite all that, we still continue to collaborate. Two visitors from the uh, USA, Peter and Karen McFarlane, volunteered on this project, and they were really inspired by what was going on and wanted to do some more work on the Araka Parish, because that was their traditional clan lands. There are now McFarlane spread all over the world. Some left Scotland in the 17th century, and have ended up in the USA, <clears throat> and they've got great pride in their Scottish uh, American heritage. Uh, two distant relatives, uh, Peter and Preston McFarlane, spelt differently, uh, in particular have been instrumental in uh, setting up this project and securing funding from their clan members who want to connect with their ancestors, and they want to ca capture a sense of being there. <clears throat> they are therefore interested in anything to do with the Arica Parish. The clan descends from uh, the Earls of Lennox and received a charter for the lands of Arica in the, in the 13th century. Please come in, yes. Make yourself comfortable. The McClan McFarlane name came into being in the 14th century after Parlin, a supporter of Robert de Bruce. <clears throat> the history of the clan uh, is riven with battles, skirmishes and bloody feuds which is no surprise, as loyal supporters of the Earls of Lennox, and uh, they fought against generally the Campbells and the Cahoons. Um, the 16th century was quite uh, difficult for them. They fought against Mary Queen of Scots at the Battle of Langside, were involved in the murder of Humphrey Cahoon of Luss, and uh, the Battle of Glenfruin, they, murdered, they helped to murder about 80 of the clan Cahoons. So they were, they were a pretty uh, robust lot. Uh, yeah, accused of theft, murder, and tyranny, just general, you know, everyday things in those days. The 17th century was a little better for them, although Inverugla's castle was burned by Cromwell's soldiers. Um, but they eventually made peace with the Campbells through intermarriage, so they were able to keep the peace. But one of the high points of the Macfarlane history was in the 18th century, when uh, the chief, Walter Macfarlane, uh, became famous for his scholarship rather than as a fighter. Um, he inherited a rather impoverished estate, and he attempted to bring it back into its former glory. Late in life, he inherited money from his younger brother, who had been a sugar planter in Jamaica. Uh, when Walter died, the clan chief overstretched themselves financially and went bankrupt, and they sold the estate in uh, 1784. And currently, the, the clan has no chief. Uh, the last one died without children. So on the left, we have the clan Macfarlane coat of arms, as it was in the 17th century. Loch Sloy being their, their rallying cry. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Loch Sloy is now a reservoir for a hydroelectric dam, so any sites that would have been surrounded that are now underwater. So a drought is quite good in that sense, possibly. Not in any other ways. <clears throat> On the right you can, is the present parish of Arica at the top end of Loch Lomond. Uh, it was originally part of the Lust Parish, but got separated in the 17th century. Uh, and you can spot, I don't know if you can see there, but Arica is crossed sort of east to west by other glens, including Glen Douglas in the south, the Isthmus between Loch Lomond and uh, Loch Long, and Ingvaruglas water, and then at the top you've got Strathdu Ishki in the north. <clears throat> so you can see that the Macfarns were surrounded by powerful clans from whom they often had conflict. <clears throat> So uh, the, uh, Peter and Preston McFarlane offered to commission a detailed survey of the whole parish, um, which I was quite happy to take on board, but realised it would take a lifetime. So uh, we agreed on a compromise of 15 days. 
<laughs> Hoping I'd live a bit longer than that. So before I head into the hills, I <coughs> consulted the historic maps, and we're very lucky to have a couple of Pont maps of the late 16th century. Uh, we discovered uh, an Edgar map in 1745, which wasn't on the National uh, Library of Scotland webpage. Then we have Roy and, of course, the first edition maps. So from that produced quite a few potential 16th or 17th century place names. And the documentary research has been helped immensely by the antiquarian Walter McFarlane's collection of papers, uh, which are now in the Hill Collection. And these go back to the 14th century uh, and has been used by one of the few papers written uh, on, the, on the McFarlane's this century, called uh, Barbarous and Yet Mixed with Some Show of Civility. I think it's uh, quite a nice title for that. That's DJ Johnson Smith's uh, master's paper on, and his map on the right. So the, the Hill Collection now is in the uh, Procurator Fiscal Library in Glasgow. Um, amazingly, it's kept in an old iron chest, which you can see at the top there. And uh, there, there's us uh, looking through the papers, uh, which include property sales, inheritance, and other activities of the clan chiefs. Unfortunately, they're written in either Latin or secretary hand, so it really does require somebody skilled in uh, archiving and these techniques to really draw out as much as possible from these papers, but that's a huge potential there for someone. We've also been lucky to have involvement of a local retired librarian, Alistair McIntyre, who has uh, extensively researched many of these settlements in the vicinity of his home, and here he is digging at Highmore Lagan. And on the left is just a list of some of the sources he used. He's a bit like an Exocet missile. You just have to sort of aim him onto a, a settlement and he will then research it to pieces. It's amazing. You just got to set him off and he brings back all this amazing information. Also, what I would do is look at the aerial photographs. Um, and this, I, this particular web page is very useful, the side by side, where you can zoom in, uh, find remains, and you can check it on the map on the left, and then you can actually get the grid reference, which you can then take out into the field and check uh, whether it is real or not. There were a few sites on Canmore already, but not very many, and generally along the lock side, unsurprisingly, but also where there had been uh, a recent overhead power line put in, so obviously there's been a, a wee commercial project there, but really very little on Canmore before we started. So armed with these maps and photographs and the list of potential sites, we uh, recruited local volunteers, students, and members of the Association of Certificated Field Archaeologists who undertake a targeted rapid walkover survey in the spring of 2016. By rapid walkover survey, I mean we strolled across the landscape and then we found sites, we would take photographs, draw sketch plans with dimensions, write a brief description record the grid reference with a handheld GPS, and then we'd move on. That was it. It's certainly not an inch-by-inch inch coverage of the landscape, as I wanted to get a flavour of really what was there. So we, we also uh, concentrated on the more accessible uh, lock side and straths. And in total, we found 88 new sites, well, most of which are new to the archaeological record. And these included uh, single shielings or groups of shielings, single houses, barns or byres, farmsteads, several sheep folds and pens, corn drying kilns, a possible whiskey still, uh, ruined bridges, remnants of the old military way, and also uh, a possible hunting lodge associated with a story about mischievous Duncan and the burning of the Athol men. So as an example, Glen Douglas was one of the areas we surveyed. Uh, in which there were 37 sites that we found. And this clearly re represents a much denser population than there is now. This forms the southern boundary of the Arica Parish. And I was, my eye was drawn to that funny blip that you see going up Tullock Hill, which I thought was a bit odd. Um, so uh, Rona McFarlane did some research, and she discovered that there had been a farm there called Tullock and Tall, which... Um, was owned by the Cahoons back in the 16th century. So we reckon when the parish boundary was being fixed in the 17th century, there was some kind of land agreement between them that was sort of to uh, uh, reduce this uh, clan feuding. It was a kind of land decision. Let's, we'll let you have that. We'll keep this in our parish and let's call it a day. In, the, in this uh, glen, there were two farmsteads of particular interest. 
This one was uh, surrounded by forestry. Uh, it was not shown on the first edition map, so initially we had no idea of what its name was. Uh, and we chose this to do a survey, and uh, this is a, a hand-drawn, taped-off survey by members of ACFA, and I think it's delightful. There are clearly two main groups of structures on either side of the stream, <coughs> each consisting of a house and a barn, with enclosures and an area of laser beds. Uh, the structures are rectangular in shape with square corners, which to me suggests that they are late 18th or early 19th century in date. The second site uh, was in more open ground and consisted of at least three rectangular structures, a large square kale yard in the top left there, uh, a circular kiln and a knocking stone. For those who aren't sure what a knocking stone is, it's something you dip your fingers in when you're hot, no, it's a, it was a large stone for, for preparing your porridge. You kind of put your grain in, mix it with it, and you pound it, prepare your porridge in the mornings. So using Edgar's map, we were able to identify several settlements along the north side of the Strath, uh, and this revealed a couple of likely place names, two of, <coughs> two of which you can see there, Garten Fern and Kreutner. And I do apologise for my pronunciation. Um, I was brought up in Reading, what can you say? I do my best. Um, <clears throat> so we have two possible place names. And these were cons uh, cons um, confirmed by uh, uh, a rental of 1784, which you can see there, Glen Douglas, there's names listed from west to east, and we have Garten Fared and Gritnine again written down there. So we have two potential names. So I set Alistair McIntyre off, I said, find me stuff about Crite 9 and Grit 9, and he did that. So we have a timeline. Uh, the earliest he got back was 1643, and the latest was 18, well, 1841, there's no mention. So 1810 is the last birth uh, recorded at this site. It also mentions in 1708, you can see there's two, two families living in the two parts of the town. So that nicely confirms this sort of two sides of the stream idea that you get from the survey. So we don't know at this point whether these tenants were evicted or whether they just had their leases ended, but uh, certainly by, by the mid-19th century they, they were abandoned. So that's something we can research into. However, you know, looking back, you could, though the structures visible there are probably 18th, 19th century, there's a great potential for them to be medieval in date, so I think that's great interest. And neither of these two sites have had any, um, currently have had any agriculture or forestry on them, so they're kind of late untouched and Huge potential for further work. Another site I'd look at, like to look at is uh, Kamisna Clash, which is on the uh, far east side. I'll come and waste a few seconds. I'll wait. This is it, as it was in 1745. <clears throat> By 1777, the place name has become Mullin Canvas, which suggests that it's a mill. Uh, and a small lock, is, you can see it slightly to the left up the hill. By the first edition, it's quite substantial. You've got five roof structures and a, and a water channel coming down from the fairy lock on the left there. This is what it looks like today. Um, stones and boulders are strewn all over the place, and it really looks like it's been actually demolished. Um, but we could only just about detect a rectangular structure uh, in, in the remains. Although the water, uh, the, the, the laid was quite substantial. So Peter and Preston asked, well, is this a grain mill or is this a sawmill? Because it's actually located within what is uh, possibly ancient woodland, as you can see there. And uh, so I looked into that further and found that there was a mention of the clapper happer, clap and happer of the said mill of Camus the Clash in 1736. So uh, this might be an unfamiliar phrase nowadays, it certainly was to me, um, but it must have been well known in the 18th century because it's included in a poem by Robert Burns, which I shall let you read in your heads. Mm -hmm. So when I looked up the meaning of clap and happer, um, I found that it meant, uh, yes, the, the clap is, the, the, the mill clapper was the mechanism that shook the, the shoe of the mill to make sure there was a steady flow of grain going into the, into the millstones. It was usually made out of a piece of wood and it made a loud clapping sound. The happer is clearly the hopper which contained the grain. So 
So this would suggest that it was primarily a, a grain mill uh, in used by the mid 18th century, perhaps presumably for the people who lived in Glen Douglas just up the road. Um, but however, it's quite common for a sawmill uh, to be uh, added to grain mills. You know, there's more than one uh, purpose for these mills once you get going. So it's quite, could quite possibly have served more than one purpose. So uh, we've been able to carry out two excavations, one on Tarbot Isle. Um, this is a tree-covered island, uh, only 40 metres long, probably the smallest island I've, I've ever excavated on. Um, and it's, it's depicted by Pont with a, a castle on top, so we were very curious about that, so we wanted to excavate and find out what was there. Um, we excavated over 10 days and found uh, a trapezoidal-shaped structure, which I think Fiona... Fiona um, Baker had actually uh, recognised before, but we could have revealed it the, its extent. Uh, strange shaped one, um, about 13 metres long. Um, we found several sheds of 17th century pottery, a mid 17th century coin, um, a 14th or 15th century jug handle, and a 19th century clay pipe bowl. So we concluded that the building had probably been used as a lookout or a store during the disturbances of the 17th century. Uh, enabling the McFarlands to control access along the loch. And there was absolutely no evidence for this being a castle. And I think Ponce got confused with Inverugulus, which is just a bit further north. Uh, the second excavation was at Craigup Port. Um, my attention was drawn to this by a documentary reference to the clan uh, chief John McFarlane building an almshouse at, at Craigup Port during the reign of James VI, which would place it in the 17th century. Apparently, there were wall tracks of a house uh, which could still be seen in the 19th century, but after that, they sort of disappeared. So we uh, specifically targeted this area, uh, which we, uh, the place name was still known, and we, we were lucky to find this very low foundation here, so you can see there on the right-hand side being marked out by people there, uh, a small rectangular structure. Unfortunately, it was being used by campers uh, for their barbecues, so it was a bit covered in rubbish, but we managed to clear that first. And again, when we found it, we found a trapezoidal shaped uh, structure. Uh, there was a sandy floor and fragments of uh, perforated roof slates. There was no clear entrance or fireplace or hearth, uh, no mortar, uh, and no suggestion of sandstones or anything. So it's not a, a big substantial structure. It's fairly small. Um, I think ha not having any charcoal or, or fireplace is a bit unusual, and, and to me suggests that maybe it was a two-story structure. Um, with the, the, so the fireplace would have, uh, would have been on the first floor, perhaps with a, an external uh, wooden stair up to the top. So the ground floor could have been used just for storage. And again, we found uh, one broken shirt of 17th century pottery and a single shirt of green glass, which initially I was rather perturbed about, but then um, Helen Spencer has uh, confirmed that it's uh, 16th or early 17th century window glass. So again, that fits in really nicely with our date. I was, I was very pleased with that. So though we have no direct evidence that this is an almshouse, it certainly it's of the right place, it's of the right date, and it's potentially a relatively high status to have a, a window in your, to have glass in your windows. So moving on swiftly, uh, I wanted just to highlight, you know, this idea of refuge and the word spittle. Uh, there's a place map that uh, Edgar shows the spittle of Indoran and. Um, so we have Spittle and Almshouses. Uh, Derek did a study of almshouses uh, in Scotland and there were none shown in the west coast of Scotland. So I think there's obviously great potential and obviously you should get more money to do another project. So move on from that. So the <clears throat> last deal briefly with the principal homes of the McFarlands. Um, the two main ones, Inverugles Castle and Isla Navao. Um, Inverugles was burnt in the 17th century by Cromwell's troops. Uh, Ali Naval was uh, in ruins by 1814. However, there's a small, smaller structure, Clatock Moor, uh, which was a modest house. So not, the chiefs didn't always live in big castles. They roamed around. And uh, so this smaller um, structure, we tried to find during our Hidden Heritage project. Unfortunately, we, we dug up this woman's garden and only found the garden path. So it's still to be discovered. So... Uh, Another house in Vriach, New Tarbot. Um, again, that's now part of the Clay, possibly part of the Claymore Hotel. 
But this other one, Ard Leash, was be, has been suggested by one historian. So I've been trying to follow that up and see if we can get some um, idea about where that might have been. And looking at our maps, we can see that Ard Leash itself appears in Edgar's map on the right there, and also in all the subsequent maps as a quite a significant farm. So that has potential. However, if you look at the very top on the first map on the left here, Ponce map, he, he has an island, Il, I don't know how to pronounce this, Il Junlich, with a dwelling, he says. It's got a dwelling on it. So in the late 16th century, there's an island with a dwelling at the very top. If you look down to Roy's map on the right, it has, it has now become a promontory. I think the island has become joined to the shore, and it's, and it's uh, called Island Illich, even though it's a promontory. So this is Ard Leash as it is today, uh, with a modern, uh, fairly modern co cottage and some uh, roofed structures. But further, oh, further round the shore, you can see there are other structures um, in the vicinity. And you could just see the promontory on the top there coming between Ard Louis and the shore there. So we have uh, a promontory settlement here on the top of the loch, which I think is a very significant location and very worth looking into. So Eel Lunlich or Island Eelich, um, uh, we are going to uh, excavate this September. We have money from the McFarlands to excavate that. So that's very exciting news. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I hope I've given you a flavor of the amazing potential that there is for uncovering archeological sites in Arica. And it, to show that it's also been very much a team effort. You know, I said it's not all by myself. myself. Um, a team effort to bring together historical record and the maps and bring it all together within the field. In a relatively short space of time, we found 88 new sites, uh, which is a range of activities, uh, say whiskey stills and hunting lodges. And we've uh, confirmed through excavation at least two structures to be of 17th century date, which in itself is quite good because normally they tend to be 18th, 19th century. So gradually we are revealing fascinating elements of the McFarlane landscape. So I'd like to thank all the local volunteers and students. You might, you might be able to spot yourselves there. You're all there somewhere. Um, and members of, the, of ACFA who came along and helped me. I'm very grateful to you all and to North Light Heritage for their assistance. And finally, to Clan McFarlane for helping to, to funding this project. I thank them all. Thank you.